2, verses 13 and 14 reads, And there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. For well, this third week of Advent, we ponder God's promise of peace. We long for that peace that causes nations and families to put down their weapons and hold each other in their hearts. We pray for the Prince of Peace to reconcile our sinful lives to a peaceful God. And we groan with our anxious minds for the peace which passes all understanding. God gives us the Prince of Peace, whose birth we now prepare to celebrate. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, we pray for peace today. From chaos, you bring order. From hate, you bring friendship. From competition, you bring cooperation. Come into our lives in an unexpected burst of glory this Christmas season to overwhelm our humanity with good tidings of great joy. Remind us that peace is available to those who seek you. Lift our motives from earth to heaven and give us a vision of higher roads to walk. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at two passages today. We're going to look at two types of people, but we're going to start in Luke 2, and then we're going to end in Matthew 2. I will be reading from the New King James Version, so don't panic. All right, if you'll look with me at verse 8 in Luke chapter 2. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us, go now, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that he, they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Now, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, just put it in reverse. Go back, go past Mark, and go to Matthew. I don't hear those pages turning. Y'all are just listening, aren't you? All right, Matthew chapter 2. That was one response to Jesus' birth. Here's another. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, this is, this is much, much later. This is years later. We think they're all there at one time, and that's what they do in the movies, but this is much later. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jer Jerusalem with him. That's kind of a fancy way of saying when mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. He was troubled, so everybody was troubled. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. 
It says, they said to him, now these are the religious leaders and, and those who know the word of God, and they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down, worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now what happens after that with King Herod? Y'all know the story. What happens? He finds out these wise men betrayed him. Now you got to remember, he, wasn't, he did what he did secretly. He had a plot. Herod's referred to as the king of the Jews, and now they're talking about this ruler that will be born that will be a shepherd to the whole nation of Israel. So really, he's the king of the Jews. And so what he does is he estimates from the information he had from the wise men and the prophets that this happened in this certain time span. And so he gives an order to kill every baby that falls in that window. All the men, because that's all that would rule as king. Now, what kind of person does that? There's two responses here, and I want you to, to really see something. The shepherds, when they went and saw Jesus and, and heard that, they had this joy. They had this, this peace and joy, and they went and shared the news. The wise men have this exceedingly great joy. Herod, not so much. Herod has rage and anger, and I noticed something. We all can we all can get that, can't we? I was out here making a phone call earlier in the week, and I was just walking the parking lot and pacing while I was on the phone. And the little kids were coming off the playground. I think they were the kindergartners. They were like the five and six year old. They're adorable. Man, kids are cute when they're tiny, and they're all <laughs> smiling doing the high fives and, and life is good and just just filled me with so much happiness, joy and love. Man, kids are great. And I turn around, I'm talking and all of a sudden I hear this, ah, ah, and I turn around and there's two girls fighting over the fence. Now I saw them just seconds earlier and they were the epitome of beauty, love and joy. But now <laughs> it's rage and defiance and hatred. I mean hardcore it scared me. One of these little girls I see all the time, I didn't know that was in her. And they were, I, if they had had knives, it would have been over. And I said, hey, 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 hey. And they stopped, and one of them starts crying. The other one is angry with defiance. And then the one that's crying said, well, you know what? And they pointed to another kid and said, and they, they said, this is what she said, and started with all this profanity. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> and I'm thinking in my heart, Sam, how did this go so bad so quick? <laughs> and I looked at them, and I said, and I had somebody on the phone. They were listening to all this. <laughs> and, and I said, hey, hey, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what's going on here at the fence. What's going on? And they both started crying. Then I felt bad. They're two little girls. I said, what is going on? And the little one, the sweet little one that turned into this little monster <laughs> said, well, I was the last one in line, and the last one in line gets to close the fence, but she pushed me away, and she chose the fence, and I tried to push back on the fence, and that's how it happened. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. I said, is this true? And, and the one that was defiant, you know, she's tearing up now. I said, look, sweetie, just tell me the truth. You're not going to get in trouble. Is that true? Yes. I said, you know what? Come here. And I gave her a hug. 
I said, thank you for telling me the truth. I said, why don't you go with the rest of them? I said, I appreciate that. So she left. The other one's just bawling. I said, I said, you know, we could probably fix this. And she said, how? And I walked over and I swung the gate open. I said, close the gate. And she went. <laughs> <laughs> and she closed the gate. And, and I said, do you feel better? And she hugged my leg. You know, she hugged my leg. And she said, yeah, I feel better. I said, now let's talk about this cussing thing. I said, tell me the truth. Did she really say that? This is what she said. These are little kids. She said, no, but the other girl told me if I said that, that they would get in trouble and we might get off. <laughs> Manipulation young. And I said, this is what I said. It was so cute. I said, I said well, listen, if, if that had happened, she'd have gotten in trouble for nothing. You'd have felt bad later. And y'all are friends right now, and then you wouldn't be friends tomorrow. I said, you know what y'all probably need to do? And she said, what? I said, you probably need to give her, give her a hug. Why don't you give her a hug? And this is what she said. I don't even hug like I'm really close friends. I'm kind of weird about that. Can I shake her hand? <laughs> <laughs> I said, shake her hand. And the other kid said, yeah, she doesn't like to hug. And, and they left. Now, listen. How do they go from so sweet to so enraged? And listen, we do this too. I've seen some people that are really close and you know, they promise to do the best by each other for life and it can turn ugly quick. And the ones that would have each other's back will actually turn around and stab each other in the back. The Bible says this, where do wars and fights come from, from among you? So God's speaking to us. He's letting us know. You want to know where this comes from? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members, that war in your body? You lust and do not have. Now listen, that doesn't just mean like sexual lust. That means lusting for things, for power, for money, for control, for clothes, for different things. We desire to have it, we want it, and we don't have it. Look at the rest. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You desire to have it. You'll murder. You remember, I remember in the 80s, there was, you know, this big thing about tennis shoes, and there were some kids that got shot over a pair of shoes. Where do wars and fights come from among you? They lusted and wanted to have them. They coveted and they murdered, and they couldn't obtain it. And what that, what that talks about is we, we can grab those things, but it doesn't bring us what we thought it would bring us. It leaves us empty. You fight in war. Now listen to this. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Let me explain that a little bit. When I was working with those two little girls, and I love those kids, I really do love those kids. I was jealous for them to have what they really needed. I was jealous for them to have peace and friendship. I was jealous that they would thrive as little kids and not get all bent out of shape. That's how God is. God is a jealous God. He's not jealous because he feels like he's competing for these things. He's jealous for us. He wants the best for us. And when things draw us away from him or, or we pursue things that leave us empty or we chase things, listen, we all do this. We chase things that are going to make us what? And they make us happy for how long? Not long. And this, the spirit yearns jealously. And it says, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, listen, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the, the difference between these two people this morning. 
the shepherds were looked down upon. We kind of put them in our nativity sets, and, and we even have some pictures of shepherds on the wall, and they kind of look like they've got it all together. And they have the little lamb around their neck, and, but they weren't viewed that way. It'd be like your son or daughter coming home and saying, Mom, I've met the person that I'm going to marry and spend the rest of my life with. You have, and this is what we do. What do they do? They drive a garbage truck for the county. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with that, and there's great money in that. But what do we naturally do? Because we don't want to do this. What does your son-in-law do? drives the garbage truck for the county. That's how shepherds were viewed. They were unclean. They're low. Society looked down on them, and because of that, I don't know if you've ever been in a life position where everybody looks down on you or thinks bad about you or something happens in your soul. It humbles you. It makes you realize what's important, and shepherds were humble. That's why they were humble and lowly and, and God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The ones that received the announcement from God himself from the angels were not the religious people, were not the scribes, were not the kings. It was a bunch of shepherds that are living out in the fields watching sheep by night. Many Bible scholars think they were the ones that watched the lambs that were offered for Passover for the sacrifices for the sins of men and, and the nation. We don't know that for sure. The Bible doesn't say it. There's a lot of evidence to support that, but we don't know. But God comes to them because of their childlikeness. I didn't share a story yesterday about EA. I'm going to share it now. EA had a lot of funny stories. If you came to service yesterday, you heard a lot of them from Roy Foster. They were great. But one of them was he, was he picked up Virginia. I don't know if he picked her up from school or where, but he was driving down the road, and then all of a sudden there was this tick, 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 tick. He couldn't figure out what it was. He's trying to figure it out. He's listening. He pulls over off the side of the road, looks under the car. He's listening. Can't find it. Gets back in the car. Tick, tick. It was the turn signal. <laughs> and listen, Virginia didn't tell him. Now listen, she didn't tell him because she's being mean and thought it was funny. She loved him. She didn't want to what? She didn't tell him. He figured it out. That's a humble person. Proud people do this. Turn signal, idiot. Are there more humble people in the world or proud people? Listen, we take pride in our pride. Herod was the most powerful man of his time in that area. Master builder. That's why he's called Herod the Great, actually. That's where he gets that title. He was a master builder. He did some amazing things in that area of building. Matter of fact, the temple that Jesus talks about, that they're all amazed at, that the disciples say, hey, have you seen the temple? Guess who did that? Herod. Herod the Great, that's why he was called that. But Herod had a problem. He wasn't humble, he was proud. And anything that threatened his kingdom, his reputation, that disrespected him, whether it was a wife or a son or a servant, he'd kill him. He was to be feared, and that's what he pushed because that's how he was. The world revolved around who? Herod. And he was a horrible, horrible man. And when he heard that there's this ruler that may be born and there's these prophecies about a ruler, he wasn't going to worship anyone but himself. He referred to himself as God. So you have the poor and humble and lowly, the one that society looks down upon, and you have the one that is powerful, great, and mighty. And God comes to which one? 
comes to the humble. A proud person usually is arrogant and disdainful, doesn't have many friends. He loses his friends because it just conflicts with relationships. It's, it's just based on self-centeredness, superiority, arrogant. I call it a self-rightness. You can tell a proud person because they can't laugh at themselves. If somebody makes a joke about them and it's pretty funny, a proud person will not laugh. They will retaliate, and they may not retaliate right now, but they're going to get you for what you did to them. That's a proud person. A humble person will laugh at themselves. Shirley bought me a hat to keep my head warm. <laughs> and listen, here. She bought me a hat. I put it on. I'm not used to wearing a brim hat. They all said, that fits your head. It looks good. But I bought me a cowboy hat. I look better than that one, Sam, so I'm going to be wearing that one more. But um, it kept my head warm. It kept my ears warm. Uh, Baker was talking about it. We were talking about hats and how to get hats and all that. Now, Shirley did that because she loved me. But they said, you got a big head. You must have to wear extra large. Truth to truth. <laughs> and I said, I do have a big head. I laughed about it. And, and Shirley said, no, I don't mean it in a bad way. I said, no, I know you meant it in a physical way, but you're right. I got a big head. Proud person would not have responded that way. And if it had embarrassed them or if people around them laughed, how would a, a proud person have been? I'm going to make you pay for that. Or they just cut the other person just as quick and say something meaner to put them in their place to teach them, you don't talk to me that way. That's how Herod is. They're very destructive to themselves. They're very destructive to the people around them. And um, they can't tolerate a whole lot. I'm saying this so we can kind of look at ourselves. We're all guilty, amen or amen. We all have it. We all got this sin condition in us. I've noticed something. I, I have people tell me this all the time. Sometimes it's just I just shake my head, you know. I don't like Christians. They're the most intolerable people on the planet, and I laugh inside. That's hogwash. Disney has come out with a number of movies since I've been watching them that bashes Christianity. You know what Christians did about it? Nothing. Disney, when they did Aladdin, do you remember the movie Aladdin? Do you know they changed the whole beginning of that movie? They changed the whole song of that movie, and they changed it, and you can't find the original hardly anywhere. Do you know why? Because the Muslims said they would destroy them if they didn't change it. That's intolerable. They're scared, so they changed it. Did y'all know that? The Christians just got up and said, hey, we really didn't like that. We think it's kind of bad. Tough noogies. And that was the end of it. There's things in movies that um, I don't like. They don't need to be in them. And I'll tolerate it. I'll fast forward through those scenes because I don't want it. And then there were some Christians that came out and said, hey, we, we just want to clean the movies up. We'll... We've got a streaming service, and we can edit it ourselves. And Hollywood said, no, you're not doing that. You're leaving them, and they're fighting it in court. Which one's intolerable? There's people that press my buttons, and, and I'm very patient, and I'm loving. Is that tolerant? I have people tell me that my beliefs are wrong and you're stupid and you're ignorant and all that, and I love them and forgive. Is that tolerant? But listen, we live in our world of Herods today. If you don't think like me and believe like me, we will censor you, we will shut you down, and we will punish you to the point that we don't even speak what we think anymore. And if we do, and I've seen y'all do it, if we have an opinion and we're afraid that people around us have a different one, we whisper it because we don't want to get in a fight. Because we live in a world of parrots. They will not tolerate that. If somebody pushes their buttons, you know what they do? They will eliminate them. They'll even threaten to what? Kill them. And they even tell you what words you can and cannot use anymore and how you're going to talk to me. 
I had somebody text me the other day, and it really broke my heart because I really love this person. This is what they, they were telling me how I was going to communicate, and they were dictating terms on how I needed to do it. And I told them, it's not happening. I love you, but nobody tells me how I can talk to someone. And I'm not talking, talking bad. I'm just talking about how to speak, what to say, what name I can use, what pronouns. It's ridiculous. That's how Herod is. And at the root of it is pride. You want to know what's wrong with America? Too much pride. I'm right and you're it's my way or the, that's Herod, is it not? And when we get to that place, whether we're Christians or non-Christians, and we're acting and behaving that way, there's no humility, and there's no humbleness, and there's no openness. We're not listening. We want something, and we're going to get it, and we'll declare war to make it happen. That's, that's Herod. The shepherds are very teachable. You can see this throughout the narrative. They seek to understand. They get there. They're empathetic. They're like children. They're childlike. Christmas is about a division between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, between the unrighteous and the righteous, between the good and the bad or evil there's a division and in this these two passages i share you see how both people respond one receives jesus christ and recognizes who he is and recognizes what god has done and they rejoice and they're filled with joy matter of fact what it says in that passage about the shepherds is then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising god for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The wise men, they had exceedingly great joy. And only the humble can receive that. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And there's a, there's a Christmas story nobody talks about. It's found in the book of Revelation. Nobody's preached the Christmas story out of Revelation that I know about. It's a Christmas story. It's about the nation of Israel giving birth to a child who's going to save the world. And when the child is born, there's a red dragon there seeking to devour it. The dragon chases the child, and the child goes away and runs away for a season. It's talking about what happened in this passage. The woman that gives birth is Israel. The child is who? Jesus Christ. Who's the red dragon? Satan. And Satan really can only use Herod's. Why did Satan fall from heaven? Pride. When, he found, when pride was found in him, sin was found in him. And so when the angel says, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, really in the Greek it's peace on earth to the men who are well-pleasing to God. And peace only comes when we humble ourselves and recognize who Jesus is and receives him. And that's when we glorify and praise God the way we should. And that's the time that we have exceedingly great joy. Here it's referred to as the butcher of Bethlehem. Some said the man who tried to stop Christmas. And he was angry and bitter and furious and scared. And he died horrifically. Josephus, I think it's Flavius Josephus, said he had ulcerated organs. Don't mean to gross you out on Christmas message. Filled with maggots. Gangrene, died a painful death. Because that bitterness and anger and pride will consume you like cancer. 
in Christ, who was equal with God, did not consider it equality God to be grasped, but humbled himself to the form of a servant, not any servant, a bond servant. Childlikeness, really, when kids are being childlike, are very humble. They're very innocent. They're giving you high fives and they fill you with joy. But when they're grabbing fences and pushing people down, that's pride. Do you know who was wrong in that fence fight? Both of them. One coveted to do it and warred and pushed the other one out of the way. The other one felt entitled to do it because she was last in line and she had a right. And instead of hum, if one of them had just humbled themselves, that war would never have started. But they both dug their heels in and they went to what? Are we more Herods or shepherds? Christ is referred to as our good what? Shepherd. And if we're to imitate Christ this Christmas season, we really should humble ourselves. How do we do that? I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about. We humble ourselves by recognizing others before ourselves. We think about others. There's been a lot of deaths in the church here lately. Some of those deaths, the family have danced well together. It's brought them closer to what? But that doesn't always happen, does it? And really what happens is people start saying, this is mine. They start thinking about what is what? The ones that come together, I notice this. What's going to be best for them? What's going to be best for our kids? What's going to be best for my sister or my brother? But as soon as I go, no, no, no. That's what I want. We need to put others before ourselves. We do this in relationship. Sam treats you pretty well, doesn't he, sweetie? You know why? Because he's always thinking about himself. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> we know that's not true. We know that's not true. Listen, what's the best relationship? Y'all have seen it. There's a couple back here. I come tell them all the time. They're sickening. You know why? He's always doing this. What do you want? What do you want? I don't care. What do you want? What do you want? Sickening. They love each other, so they're always thinking about what? The other person. What's best for them? When we're planning stuff for our kids, the best way to do that is to think about who? Our kids. But you know what some of us do? Let's, uh, I know they want to go to Willie's World, but let's not take them there. If we take them to the ice skating ring, we can go shopping right next door. Listen, that's fine, but you're being selfish. And you're thinking about yourself. And you're not realizing those kids are going to be grown and gone in a few years. And it'd be worth your while to take them to Willie. So think about others. The other thing is to let God have his rightful place in your life. When we accept Christ and let him be king and lord of our life, he will guide and direct us to do what is best, not just for others, but for ourselves and so when we put him where he belongs and humble ourselves to his kingship all these things will be added to you and i really do think that's why he says the greatest commandment of all is to love your what of god with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and who's the next love your neighbor as you would yourself if we would just do that this Christmas, Christmas would be a lot better, wouldn't it? I was in Walmart. I hate Christmas. <laughs> Huge line. Huge line. And we're waiting for that self-checkout because they're doing that on purpose, by the way. Have you noticed that? I hate self-checkout. And then they tell you you're using too many bags. I'm like, man, if I'm bagging, I'm going to bag it my way. I'm, you're not paying me. I'm sorry. Who am I thinking about? There it is. See, Herod sneaks in, don't he? <laughs> Got you. I trapped you. Because y'all were going this. Yeah. 
I'm sitting in line, and, and there's all these people in line, and one of those things goes, boom, green light. Everybody's doing this, except the guy back here. And this is what he did. I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me for what I did. I let him get halfway there and said, hey, that light's on, next one in line. <laughs> now listen, that wasn't right either, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> and he comes to get back in line. This is how much of Herod we're like. Because who am I thinking? Was I thinking about the person next in line or busting this guy? Herod. The guy comes back, and in my heart, this is what I wanted to say. You got out of line, back in line. I didn't do that. But what is that? Herod. Herod's in our Bible for a reason. He's an enemy of Christ. Would you all agree? You know what the Bible called us before we gave our life to Christ? Enemies of God, because we do the same thing. And that's why Christ had to come into the world to forgive us, not just for our actions, but our thoughts and our motives and our dark heart to make us new. And when you receive Christ, one of the first things you experience is joy. It's a gift. So as we leave here today, I want to ask y'all, have y'all received that gift of Christmas? And maybe that's why you don't have the joy. The second question is this, are you loving people and putting them ahead of yourself and loving God and sharing Christ with people who've never received it yet? So as we leave here today, let's just admit we're Herod's. And let's also admit I'm thankful that Christ has changed my heart so I'm more like a shepherd every day. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us when we're unlovable. Thank you for forgiving us when we're messing up. Father, thank you for giving us new mercies every day. And as we struggle, I pray that before we do things, we would just ask ourselves, am I acting proud or humble? Am I being a Herod or a wise man? Am I being humble and low like a shepherd or arrogant like a king? Help us to be the salt and light you've called us to be. Help us to humble ourselves and help us to recognize we're sinful and need you every day. Thank you for being so good to us. We're so undeserving. And thank you for being our God and thank you for saving us from our sins. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. amen. If you want to talk to me about how to receive Christ, you grab me after church. We're going to sing, and after we sing, what are y'all going to do? Hug somebody if you go home. And so, Scott, we're going to close with <coughs> Go Tell It on the Mountain, good song to finish. We're going to sing this to the Lord this morning. singer for this one? <laughs> All right. If we do, I'll have you come down. We'll do a duet. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> Let's, the Stevens family. <laughs> All right, Stevens family. Let's step up here real quick. We'll put you on the spot. It's Christmas. <laughs> Humble yourself like a shepherd. Don't be a heret. And uh, start it again, and we'll get you to help. Okay. Come on, we'll do it. We can do this. You know Alan, come up. You'll do it. You're not scared. Oh, did you roll your eyes? Or you wanna? I'm teasing. Come on, we can do this. Come on, y'all. Oh, you sit there, sweetie. You're good. You're good. 
She's not married yet. She's not a Stevens yet. All right. All right. We can do this. We can do this. It's right there in the front. Oh, my yeah. God. You learned something new? Yeah, yeah, I got that. You've never seen it. All right. <laughs> Y'all start it. We'll go. All right. You, you got your get following. Go sailing on the mountain, over the hills. 